The Nazi Possession, a Haunted Library production. June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany. The following narrative and all of its interactions will be voiced in English for the dominant audience. Ursula Schaefer wheeled the barrel of rice back to her house. It was to be a surprise. Her father would be proud that she had saved enough money to purchase this much food, which would surely last them for the next two months. Still reeling from the loss of World War I, the country as a whole was still paying their dues to the Treaty of Versailles. They promised to downsize their army as prices for food skyrocketed. But as the years went on, Germany was slowly becoming more prosperous. Hitler was now in power, the Nazi rule in full effect, creating a newfound spirit of German pride in the air. Finally, after years of enduring a poor economy, things were finally beginning to pick up for Germany, and for 18-year-old Ursula and her family. She pushed the barrel to her backyard. Her house was on the outskirts of Berlin. Her mom spotted her from the kitchen window and went outside to meet her. Your daddy is sure going to be proud of you, she said to her daughter. Bless your heart. Let's get this rice inside and cook some for tonight's dinner. Ursula hugged her mom tight before they both worked on packing the rice. It was a warm, beautiful day. A good day to be alive if you were German and a Nazi, like the Schaefers. Before Ursula's father made it home that afternoon, Germany had begun to invade Russia in Operation Barbarossa. One month later, Ursula bit her lip as she watched German propaganda commercials from her black and white television where she worked at a local clothing resale shop. Since Germany's intrusion into Russia, most Germans were confident and stood behind their aggressive leader, Adolf Hitler. If you were a Nazi, you had no choice. She flipped her long, dark hair behind her ear and blew a bubble from the mouthful of chewing gum she had been munching on for the past hour. She chewed gum when she was nervous and she would bite her lip in these times, too. She secretly never fully believed or agreed with the rumors of what the Fuhrer and the Nazis were doing. Killings of innocent Jews, the shunning of Jews, and the invasion of Poland. She knew the reason Germany was in this mess to begin with was the Jews' fault, because according to Hitler, they alone were responsible for losing Germany the war in World War I. She didn't have anything against the Jews aside from this, which had put her family in poverty for the last few years, and the country as a whole. She just wanted Germany to win the war. As customers began to file in the store, she turned the TV down to greet them. Outside, it was another beautiful day in Germany, almost too beautiful, too pristine. Germans went on with everyday life not knowing that hell on earth was a few years around the corner. April 16th, 1945, 4 a.m., four years later. The people of Berlin knew the enemy was coming. They had known for a while now. Germany was losing the war, despite a promising initial onslaught the first year. The Red Army was just around the corner, finally beginning to break through the first lines of German defense that was protecting the town. It was all still unbelievable, however, considering just a few short years ago, Germany was a dominant country and Berlin was a pristine town of gold and vibrance. The mass suicides had begun, some Germans hanging themselves before the Russians could imprison them, others dying by self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Ursula and her parents had refused to leave the town in the months leading up to the invasion. Like many Germans, they held on to the hope that the Russians would show mercy on the citizens of Berlin. Hunkered down in their home, they could hear gunfire. Today was the first day they had heard it. The shots had started early that morning and had continued all afternoon. Holed up in their home, they waited for the inevitable. There had been a lot of crying throughout the night by all three members of the family as uncertainty drew closer. But never was there any mention or word of suicide in this family. 10 p.m. Same day. A small group of Russian soldiers from the 1st Belarius Front surrounded the house that sat in the middle of the hayfield just outside Berlin. 
The men were near exhaustion and were very hungry. This would be the first house this group would visit that night, but not the last. Inside, Ursula could hear the men outside as they made their presence no secret. She clung to her parents in a back bedroom. The soldiers easily kicked in the front door, and Ursula screamed for the first time that night. It wouldn't be her last. The group of four men made their way through the home until they came to the back bedroom to see the family cowering in a closet. They were ordered out of the closet and met with guns to their faces. Ursula, sobbing and shaking uncontrollably, stood. She was yanked away from her parents. Her mom screamed now, putting her arms out for her daughter. She was slapped so hard she nearly passed out. Ursula was brought to another bedroom where she would be raped throughout the night. Before leaving the house in the early morning hours, the soldiers had decided to kill her by strangulation, leaving her parents to weep over their daughter's disgraced and abused body. Two days later, Berlin, 1 a.m., the following narration is told from the central character's point of view in the story. Tony Bailey was among the first of a small group of Americans to reach Berlin on the east side of town. Here, there was only small signs of recent gunfire and small battles. A large open field lay ahead of him and his two comrades. They had broken off from their first U.S. Army patrol group when they'd gotten caught off guard by German gunfire a mile from Berlin. Unable to relocate their patrol group, they stayed close together and hunkered down as they walked, sometimes crawling when necessary. Tony was 22 and engaged to be married to his fiancée who was back in Alabama. They had one kid together who was two months old. The sudden deployment had been hard on both himself and his soon-to-be wife. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S.'s involvement in the war was inevitable and Tony's group had been pushing hard through Germany for the last two months. But as their target was nearly in sight, that being Berlin, tragedy struck as he and his partners were again caught off guard by German snipers and taken captive to a small underground bunker that housed eight jail cells. The conditions of the jail-like bunker were terrible. It was obvious the Germans had built it specifically for possible captures. The floors were mostly of plywood and dirt. The cells were cold. The bars solid. The Americans had been roughed up before being thrown in. Since, they had been provided little to no food through the bars. They had been drinking their own water and were very weak. Tony was no longer able to get a letter to a boat to be delivered home, but he wasn't worried about himself as much as he was worried about his fiance worrying about him. After the third day, around noon, a group of five Russian soldiers were led into the remaining cells. Tony watched as they were shoved from behind by the Nazi soldiers, one by one being led past his cell down the small, dark, damp, cold hallway. One German soldier used the butt of his rifle against the back of one of the Russians' head, nearly knocking him out. It was obvious the Germans were much more hostile towards the Red Army than they were the Americans. In a few minutes, the Germans walked past again on their way out, spitting in Tony's cell. He ignored it and kept quiet. He could now hear gunfire outside in the distance. His thoughts kept going back to his newly born daughter and the woman who he missed dearly. He fell asleep that night to the sound of the Russian detainees bickering and talking. He couldn't understand what they were saying, but whatever the conversation consisted of, it was heated. Like Tony and his group, the Russian soldiers were obviously disgusted and scared of being captured by the Nazis. Sleep was rough and the night had grown colder than the previous nights. Around 2 a.m., Tony woke up with a start, shivering from the cold, his stomach growling. He listened for a few moments, blinking his tired eyes in the dark. Outside, there was no gunfire or commotion, but something had woken him. After a few minutes of silence, a noise came from down the hall. It sounded like a sloppy, messy type of noise, like a dog was lapping up a pile of discharged mush. He finally set up, his back aching. The noise came again. He stood and grabbed the bars to his cell. He called out softly to the cell to his left where his friend Matt was. Hey man, wake up. Did you hear that? He got no answer. He could barely hear Matt snoring. Matt, wake the hell up! Matt woke this time and answered. 
I keep hearing some weird shit down the hall, towards those red cells. Matt listened, then confirmed the noise. Matt listened, then confirmed the noise. The sounds began to grow louder. Now it not only sounded like somebody were eating something, it sounded like whoever was doing the eating was beginning to moan, and the sound sent chills down Tony's spine in ways nothing in the war had. Another few moments of silence. Then the sound came again, and this time it was moving closer to his cell. It stopped just short of his sight in the darkness. He aimed his light to the left corner of the cell, illuminating the hallway. He thought about hollering at the Russian soldiers, but thought better of it. He didn't know if the Germans had let a wild animal loose in here, or maybe one of the Germans had crept in here tonight to kill the captive. Tony didn't fall asleep again that night. For hours, he listened to the faint sounds of something near the floor, just beside the left side of his cell, slobbering and salivating like a rabid dog, but in a very hushed tone. Whatever it was, was just out of sight from his light. Dear Becky, the letter began, It's me again. I am still captive in this shithole of a jail. I don't know if they are going to shoot us or have us starved to death. I'm hungry as hell, but my hunger for missing you burns deeper. I don't know if these letters will ever make it to you, but I at least have to try. If I get out of here alive, I will find a ship and get them across the ocean. I have a bigger problem now. I can only hope some of our soldiers or the Red Army will come, find us, and free us. Somebody is killing the men that are in here with me. I think it's a rogue German soldier who is sneaking in at night. If I had a gun, I would blow him away, but as I said in yesterday's letter, we are all stripped of our weapons. Last night, they drug out the bloody body of a Russian soldier who was four cells down from me. A group of Russians were captured and are in here with us. I have to go now. Just know that if this letter sees you, and I don't, always know that I love you and take care of our daughter. Please kiss her on the cheek for me. I love you both. Your soon-to-be husband, Tony. On the fourth night, Tony again heard gunfire sounding off. Having no idea what it was, he could only speculate it was dark. He had completely lost track of time and had spent most of the day writing letters to his fiancée and talking to his comrades in the cells to his right. Another friend had been placed in the cell directly in front of Tony's. Between them all, they were helping one another from going insane by staying positive. With hunger pains rumbling his stomach, he finally fell asleep sometime around 1 a.m., thirsty and weak. He woke to a noise sometime after 3. His friend Jared, the guy across from him, had called out his name. Tony sat up and muttered, What is it? Jared explained what had woken him, and what he'd been listening to for the past 30 minutes. The two men stopped whispering when the gargling noise came closer. They both shut up and listened. There was no noise from the Russian cells. Without saying another word, Tony sat back down on the floor and continued to listen. The sound of bars began to squeak, like the opening of a cell door. He stood, the hair on the back of his neck tingling. Somebody had opened a cell door where the Russians were. Noise came closer. It was heavy breathing and hissing. A scream erupted from one of the Russian cells as he blurted out what could only be taken as profanities from fear. The screams continued as the sounds grew louder. Suddenly, something totally different began to scream too. Something with a much deeper, horrifying sound. Tony's breathing grew erratic as he began to panic. Something had just killed another Russian soldier and whatever it was had woken at least one of the others. Tony panicked, pacing the cell, talking to all three of his friends. The thing in the hallway slithered around, hissing and gurgling. It slithered up to Tony's cell and looked in, and Tony jumped back. His friends began to holler out, as did the remaining Russians. Tony could tell that the figure was slender and small. It had black, stringy hair and a face of a human. The face of a girl. The body of a girl. But the eyes of a demon. The skin of a demon. And the mouth of a bloodthirsty lion. Suddenly she stood, shaking the bars to his cell violently. A type of fear ran through Tony that he had never felt in the war. It was a feeling of the unknown and disbelief. He knew had the thing outside his cell wanted to, it could have came in to kill him. He braced himself for an attack, his heart rate going through the roof. But as soon as he had stiffened up, she had flopped back to the floor and slithered back down the hall in the way that she had come from. 
What the fuck was that, Tony? Asked Mickey, his friend directly to the right of his cell. Tony, in shock, only listened as the bars to his cell down the hall opened and screams of bloody murder began to erupt again. The now demonic entity of Ursula Schaefer began to attack the next Russian soldier who had raped her nearly a week ago. It was a mismatch. Her speed and power versus his weakened body. In the same way her merciless rape had been a mismatch. Her evil attributes that she had accepted minutes after her spirit had left her body was on full display now. She straddled him as he flung his hands in a pathetic attempt to protect his face. Her bottom jaw opened longer than it ever should have, revealing a monstrous mouth of jagged teeth and bloody gums. She lowered her head and began to eat his neck, taking a bite out of his juggler as he convulsed, his legs shaking and his hands flopping around in his untimely departure from the living. She continued to growl and snarl as she ate, finally finishing 90% of his intestines and internal organs before choking the last breath of air from his lungs, crushing his neck with her force. The cell was covered in pools of blood that seeped out into the hall. The Russians that were still alive from that faithful group were also eaten that night, one by one, until Ursula had fulfilled her restless spirit with revenge. As she slithered out from the last cell in the late morning hours, the Red Army had taken full control of Berlin. She passed the cells, looking at each American on her way out. The men stood frozen in terror, having heard the gruesome pleas and screams of the Russians for the past three hours as they were eaten alive. She scooted to the door, then stood, passing straight through it. Once outside into the darkness, she went straight for the tree line and faded into the woods. She covered the distance of over a hundred yards in just three seconds as her figure dissipated into the night. There would be plenty of other unexplainable, unimaginable deaths in the next few weeks. None of the deaths were consistent with gunfire, however. It was as if something had eaten the soldiers. The victims were all members of the Red Army. Two days later, the men in the underground jail were finally rescued by a large group of American soldiers. They were all on the verge of kidney failure with extreme dehydration, and all three were still in a state of shock. But Tony had survived not only the war, he had survived a hungry demon. Six months later, Tony arrived home in the USA to his wife, to his kid, to his family. He would waste little time in marrying the woman of his dreams this time, trying to leave the war behind him, trying his hardest not to think about what happened those few nights as he was enclosed against his will with something that had sold its soul to Satan in return to seek revenge on any soldier that bore the Russian badge. To this day, over 70 years later, Russia is still reporting unexplainable deaths in the dense mountain regions. The demonic entity of Ursula has been spotted several times but never caught on camera. The Nazi girl comes like a thief in the night, like the men who took her innocence, the men who took her life. She comes with ruthless abandon and always leaves with a meal, as she is bound to earth for eternity to seek revenge on the unsuspecting. <laughs>